All right. Welcome, everyone, to episode four of the fifth edition. This is John Parings. I'm John Montoya. All right. And today we are going to talk about another common question that we get about life insurance when discussing the infinite banking concept. And one of the big things that we'll hear from people or one of the kind of big concerns is that people really want to know what the rate of return on the cash value of a life insurance policy is. And so, you know, when you're, when, when we're talking with, you know, prospective clients, almost, you know, one of the fir very first things is, well, what's the rate of return on this cash value? And um, so John, I don't know what you get, what you say when, uh, when you hear that question. So I love to turn it around. We'll typically say, well, what's the return on money you'll never see again. And I'll just, be quiet and I'll wait. And that's because in a correctly structured life insurance policy, um, when using the infinite banking concept, one of the, one of the important factors is we're always getting uninterrupted. That's an important, um, important descriptor, uninterrupted compounding interest or compounding growth where anything else if you spend, if you pay cash or you use debt to pay for something, that's a form of financing where you never get the money that was spent. You never get that back into your financial life ever again. Yeah, it's an either or proposition with that money. We also refer to it as opportunity cost. Right. And, you know, one of the simpler ways that we'll explain it is tell people, look, there's three types of people in the world two of which you, you know of, and you're probably one of these two people. You're either a saver or you're a debtor. And what we mean by that is if you're a saver, you're the type of person who will save money first. That way you have that uh, pool of money you can use to make a large expenditure. But once you make that expenditure, that money is gone. You'll never see it again. It's never earning another dollar of interest for you. It's simply gone. So that's, that's the first type of person. The second type of person is a debtor. And rather than save up the money first for a large purchase, what they'll do is go out and take a loan, or maybe they'll put it on their credit card. Uh, but either way, they're going into debt and they're having to make payments just to get back to you know, that zero dollar line, if you will. And they right. repeat the same process over and over and over again. And savers do this too. Save up, spend, save up, spend. And there's this constant interruption of growth on this money because you're, you're spending it and you're never going to have access to it again. It's never going to grow for you. And so the third type of person, the one that most people don't know about, uh, is the wealth creator. And these are the type of people that uh, we are trying to um, turn into clients because we want them to see that bigger picture where they can accumulate wealth and do it in the best spot possible and then have access to that wealth, that, that cash value inside these IBC designed whole life policies, take a loan, and like you mentioned, not interrupt the growth. And in doing so, they're going to create wealth over their lifetime. I love the way you, uh, you describe that. That's great. <clears throat> You've got the, the spenders, the debtors, and then the wealth creators. And, and that might, this conversation might be one of the toughest to, for people to wrap their head around where the rate of return of the cash value, while it's important, it's not the most important thing. You know, all the best rated insurance companies out there, are going to have some kind of similar total return on the cash value. And that's not, and so when we look at that, it's not really the most important thing to focus on. And all of those best companies out there, all the highest rated, you know, oldest insurance companies, they'll have very similar growth um, on, on life insurance, cash value and death benefit. And um, it's really more about how we're using the cash value to become that wealth creator that makes a much bigger difference than the actual rate of return of the cash value. Yeah, something Nelson writes about in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker, is the amount of interest that leaves the average household. 
And he pegs this number that for every dollar someone brings home, they have approximately 34 or 35 cents that goes out the window in interest expenses. That's basically your mortgage, your car loans, large ticket item that you're constantly having to finance. And the, the point he's trying to make is that what's more important, eight to 10% rate of return that we're all conditioned to, to chase uh, on whatever investment dollar that we have, or the 34 and a half cents that's going out the window every single month in the form of interest. What did he call that? Uh, snakes and dragons, something right. along those lines, right? Right, right. He, he always referred to it as, as snakes and dragons. And if you actually look at the bigger picture, you'll see that we're so consumed as a society on chasing that eight to 10% of return on a small amount of money. And we have an even bigger chunk that we have no control over going out the window every single month. I liken it to, you know, if you're talking to one of your good friends at, uh, at a happy hour at a, at a party and, and, you know, and you're discussing your, your 401ks, you know, oh, my 401k is up, you know, 10% this year. Oh, great. Well, you know, the one thing you're not talking about is what you have going out the window. No one ever talks about that. We don't even think about it. And so that's why Nelson's book is so important because it, it absolutely gets you to change your way of thinking and to realize that you need to, to focus on the bigger picture and what's actually leaving your, your personal economy. And if you focus on that, then everything else is going to fall into place. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, just to tack onto that story, you know, it's like everyone gets around, um, you know, at the, at the punch bowl at the party and talks about the rate of return they're getting on the 10, 15% of their money that they're investing. Well, what about, what about the other 85%, you know, what's happening with that? (laughs) And, uh, and so it, it, when you start to really think about that, it, it kind of changes the way you think about everything else and the way you think about money in general. Yeah. One, one thought that blows my mind is you think about how much you make each year, And where does that money go first? It goes through a bank account in a bank account that you don't own or control, right? So you don't earn any profit from, from that bank, but we, we direct all the income that we earn. And if you think about that, how much do you take home every single year? How many years are you going to work? You literally have millions of dollars passing through someone else's bank that you're going to spend and never see again. Maybe you invest it someplace else eventually, but that's money that washes through someone else's system that you don't own control or profit from. And what we're teaching with the infinite banking system is, is how to take back that control to redirect a good portion of that money into a, a banking system if you will, through these IBC designed whole life policies where you can continue to grow that money uninterrupted, even while you use it someplace else. And that's why, that's why it's not really the most important thing, the rate of return on the cash value really. So when I get, I'll get people that, you know, want me to send them illustrations so that they can go out and kind of compare different, different insurance companies. And I, I certainly understand the, um, desire to want to do that. Everyone wants to make sure they, they understand what's going on, but because they're all going to be within the same ballpark in terms of the returns, I think the most important thing is to find an advisor who knows what they're doing and that you like and that you trust because the real rate of return is really what you can do with the control and leverage that you have over your cash inside a whole life insurance policy. Yep. And, and there absolutely will be a savings component, a growth rate to these right. policies, but it's not the reason why you, you start an IBC designed whole life policy. Sometimes uh, the, the conversation will head in a direction where, you know, when I'm talking about rate of return with people, I'll, I'll tell people, look, I told you there, there are savers, debtors, and wealth creators. Mm-hmm. There's also a mindset where you, you have what I call an employee mindset, or you can have a business owner mindset. Now, if you have an employee mindset, that's typically where you're thinking 
of utilizing an IVC policy like it's your 401k, like you're just going to save it, forget about it. And when you retire at age 60, 65, or whatever age um, works out for you, that money's going to be there. And then you're going to start to use it. Right. And that's, that, that's, you know, that's that employee 401k mindset. And what I really hope is that people begin to understand that, well, if you really want to utilize IBC to its fullest potential, you need to start thinking like a business owner, because if you think like a business owner, you're going to realize that you have access to this growing pool of capital each and every year that you can use to generate more wealth, or maybe it's, it's to expand your business, uh, to buy a business, whatever the case may be, you start thinking like a business owner and the whole world opens up to you as opportunities that you can take advantage of. Right tomorrow, next month, you know, six months from now, uh, when an investment opportunity comes your way, instead of passively just sitting by and waiting, waiting 10, 20, 30 years for that magic retirement date to, to happen and hope, you know, if you have a 401k that the money will be a certain amount here, um, you don't even have to worry about what, what the cash value is going to be because, you know, contractually, it's going to grow every single year. But the idea is you want to start to take advantage of it. You want to be a business owner mindset. You want to have that mindset with IBC. Yeah. And, and you need, in order to have that mindset, you need to have capital. And that's exactly what these whole life insurance policies provide, where they provide you a cash asset. And, you know, um, we've talked about this before, where the rich dad, poor dad people, you know, if they've read that book, they understand the difference between buying assets and buying liabilities. And we all know that wealthy people buy assets that increase in value. Even better, they buy assets that generate an income. And so to your point, when you have this available capital that you can use and then and also leverage safely to take advantage of those opportunities that come along, like you know, maybe your neighbor wants to sell their house and they want to do it fast. They want to move to, you know, Florida and just retire. You get a good deal on it. If you have the cash available, all of a sudden now you're, you've, you've just bought, you know, your first rental property, something that you've used the, 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 you've leveraged your life insurance policy cash value to buy another income generating asset. And so, that's what kind of what I was talking about before where the rate of return, the real rate of return is what you can do with when you can safely leverage that cash value to buy other income generating assets. Right. Two is always better than one. Right. <laughs> you know, if, if you, and this, this comes back to the either or proposition, right. You know, we'll talk to people who are looking at investments and, you know, I'll challenge them a little bit and I'll say, well, look, you can have that investment for sure, but with IBC, you can have your whole life policy and you can now take advantage of that investment. Which would you rather have? Two right. assets working for you at the same time or just one? Yeah. And you know, when, if someone's comparing um, the rates of return, they're usually thinking of, again, they're trying to, think of life insurance as an investment. And on the, in the last podcast episode we did, we talked about how, you know, this is not an investment, it's a cash asset. And, you know, if, if you look at an investment, let's say it's gonna give you 10%, well, does that 10% come with risk? And is there a better way, if you could have two 5% accounts that have no risk or very little risk, which one of those is better, you know? Um, so all of those things to think about where, we have these opportunities to have options to do, to do more than one thing at the same time with the same money. Right. Absolutely. And just to, to piggyback on, on the word asset, um, most people don't think about life insurance as an asset, right? It is, it is absolutely an asset. Um, think of it like, property, real estate property, that's an asset. And you can go get a loan uh, to, to buy a house. Once you own it, you build up equity, you can take uh, equity line of credit 
to access some of that equity? Well, in a permanent life insurance policy, specifically a whole life policy, you're building up that equity in the form of cash value and you have the ability to take uh, loans, policy loans, and use that equity someplace else. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and when, and when you have those opportunities to do that, um, where you can use money, just like the banks do, because we're creating, we've become our own banker, um, the, the rate of return on the life insurance cash value becomes a rounding error. <laughs> and so that's why it's, it, 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 while it is important, it's not the most important thing if you're looking at things through the infinite banking concept lens. Right, which is always have access to cash mm -hmm. and always keep your assets growing yep. no matter what. So what is cash value? Why is it there in the first place? That's a good question. I'm going to let you lead with that one. Okay. Well, um, the cash value is really um, a reflection of the death benefit, right? So when you buy a life insurance policy, whether it's term, whether it's whole life, whether whatever it is, they all come with a death benefit. So that's the, that's the life insurance component of it and a death benefit. And so we're going to stick to the whole life example. The death benefit is a guaranteed future cash flow. And because that's a guaranteed future, future cash flow, that that future value has a present value. You know, one of the um, speakers at the, the last couple of um, uh, infinite banking think tanks, uh, Ryan Griggs, did a really good job of explaining how this works, where the, the cash value is the present value of the future death benefit, less, um, you know, all of the uh, future premium payments. And so it becomes a very important piece that it's not just a it's not just a savings account and it can't just live on its own. It has those aspects, but you have to have the death benefit in order to have the cash value. And so um, I'm bringing that up because a lot of people get a little too focused on cash value and they, they try to create these life insurance policies that are all cash value. You can't really have that, but like 90% cash value. And it ends up creating some issues where um, the, the policy can become a modified endowment contract or uh, you have to pay up the policy super early where you can't put any more cash into it. Um, but these, the cash value is, is, again, the present value of this guaranteed future cash flow. And so it becomes very important that we're growing both of these things where it's not only saving us in the interest cost, but future tax payments as well as this cash value keeps growing. We could probably do a whole nother podcast on that. But it's this cash value that is really starting to become the thing that we use over the course of our lives that we, we can leverage that money to create other opportunities in our life, creating multiple rates of return rather than focusing on trying to get a high rate of return. Yeah. And one of the things that I try to impress upon with IBC when it comes to cash value and that future death benefit is that, this is the one place where you can park money and know that without any luck, skill, or guesswork on your part, you're guaranteed to know the, the end result. And that's, you know, exactly. whether it's in year one, year five, year 20, or at age 100 or 121, you have this blueprint for success and it's going to work out on a guaranteed level and then beyond that you have the dividends but you have this roadmap every single year of your life without any risk without any uncertainty that you have to take in comparison to you know floating an investment uh, for people that you know buy mutual funds and hoping it's going to be at you know uh, five hundred thousand a million dollars when they retire whatever the case may be and hoping for that to happen none of that hope even even registers with IBC because you have this blueprint that is contractually written in stone. It, it's, it's going to happen no matter if you're not even around to see it happen, which is a pretty incredible thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, having that level of control and certainty 
by having that, the, by having these guarantees, you now can afford to take some risk in other areas where you're not sacrificing your whole, or maybe sacrificing isn't the right term. It could be, but you're not putting your whole financial life on the line by putting all of your money into these non-guaranteed accounts. These accounts with no guarantees, no collateral. Um, and that's kind of what most people do. Most people, you know, they get their paychecks and they immediately you know, funnel as much money as they can into these qualified plans where they have no control, they have no collateral, no guarantees, and they're completely skipping the first, you know, area where they, where they should be focusing, where building up a guaranteed cash asset that, like you said, is, is rock solid and bulletproof and is, is a blueprint to guaranteed growth over the, over the course of your life. And now you can do both things. You can have the guaranteed growth and you can afford to take some risk with some of your other money in other areas. Right. And we, we've hinted at it in previous podcasts where we talk about using IVC as a volatility buffer in conjunction with your 401k and IRA. And I suppose we're going to hint at it again because this will be a future podcast <laughs> yeah. episode. But yeah, that that's absolutely another benefit of IBC is that uh, when you combine it with your qualified accounts, it can help you to uh, make sure you don't run out of money in retirement. It's just an added benefit. It's really the only true way you can invest, quote unquote, invest for the long term. And I, so I'm excited to do that episode. We we should probably do that pretty soon because we <laughs> yeah we <laughs> we, <laughs> we need to put some some notes together uh, right. on that. So. I know we have an idea for next week, so maybe maybe the following week we'll, right. we'll focus on yeah. uh, IBC as a volatility buffer. I like so, that. Um, let's let's talk about the two components to growth. Yeah, where that rate of return does come from within yes. an IBC uh-huh. whole life plan. So there's two components of growth. There's the guaranteed growth, that guaranteed interest that you're going to see every single year in that whole life contract. And then you have the non-guaranteed growth, which are the dividends. Right. And the dividends come from the surplus profit of these mutual-based life insurance companies, mutual-based, meaning that you and I as policy owners are part owners of, of the life insurance company. Yes. So they, they don't pay out a portion of their profits as a dividend to, let's say, shareholders on Wall Street. You have to own a whole life policy with a mutual based company in order to receive that dividend. And the IBC companies that we work with, they have a few common characteristics. They've all been around for at least 100 years. They're all A rated. And the thing that impresses me the most is that they've paid a profit, meaning they've paid, I'm sorry, they've paid a dividend from their profit. So they've had to had a profit every single year for at least 100 years. And some go back over 170 years without missing a dividend. Right. It's crazy. It is crazy. It's so it's, it's like, uh, you know, people look at, you know, their stock market investments and look at these dividend aristocrats, which, you know, totally legitimate, but then will completely dismiss the track record of these mutual insurance companies of having, you know, every bit as good a track record as any of the dividend aristocrats. And by the way, guaranteed. <laughs> right. And, and well, I'm sorry, just... the dividends not guaranteed, but the, the, uh, the gar- there's a guaranteed growth component plus the dividend that hasn't been missed for sometimes up to 170 years for some companies. Correct. And, and I was going to say that just goes back to conditioning right? We're conditioned to think uh, we got to park our money in a traditional bank. We need to park money in our 401ks, put money into an IRA. And we we don't think about life insurance companies as a place to park a portion of our wealth, but it absolutely needs to be a place that we consider because money does have to reside someplace. And when you think about where you want your money to reside, and all the, all the best characteristics that you can get, right? Continuous, uninterrupted growth, uh, access to your money when you need it, when you want it. If you can reduce or eliminate taxes on that growth and on the access, even better. Uh, just 
it, it keeps going and going, going. When you're looking for the perfect place to park money, you, you get this long list of benefits from an IBC designed whole life policy that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And I mean, I, it's, it's really, you know, as we talk about it, it's still, <laughs> my, my mind still spins a little bit sometimes with all the dimensions of that uh, correctly structured life, whole life insurance policy you can offer someone. It really is just one of those things that if you have some, it makes everything else you're doing in your life perform even better. And so it just becomes kind of a no brainer in terms of, you know, why you should have some, um, you know, starting with just having some life insurance to protect your family all the way to creating, you know, wealth exponentially compared to what you could do without it. Yeah. And I'd even go as so far to say that when you look at your overall portfolio, take some of the money that you have as part of your bond mix and replicate that bond portfolio with properly designed whole life policies. Because what, what happens is these life insurance companies, they have to be ultra conservative with every premium dollar they take in and they have to invest those dollars. And where do life insurance companies invest the bulk of, of all those premium dollars, like 80 to 90% of those dollars go to buy corporate bonds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which currently are maybe paying four to 5%, but that that's money that they sit on till maturity and then they just right. roll it over into the next corporate bond issue that they're gonna buy and they just sit on it. And that, that's why these companies are so profitable. They, they, they look at the bigger picture. They're, they're thinking, you know, not the next quarter and what, you know, what earnings are going to be uh, so much as, you know, how is this going to affect policyholders five years from now, 10 years from now, a generation from now. Right. And it's a completely different mindset, which should also uh, really mirror the type of mindset you have as an individual, because if you're thinking, What's, what's the best rate of return I can get? And what's it going to be, you know, next quarter, next year? You know, you, you're chasing something that you, you'll, you'll never catch. You know, those 8, right. 10, 12% returns, it's great when you can get them, but they're elusive. And, That's right. you know, there, there's, um, there, there's a report, the Dalbers report, that has shown that the average investor barely gets like 2% per year invested in the marketplace. That's right. And a lot of it's because they have to make emotional decisions, um, you know, during market corrections or, and then on the, and then when that, when it swings back up or they're forced to dip into some of their investments, um, you know, where we're seeing some things right now where people are not able to work and not make an income. And, and if that's the case and they haven't correctly capitalized and, and, created an emergency fund, they're now having to dip into their investments and pull money out uh, at the potentially the wrong time, which um, keeps them from doing that invest for the long term. And it keeps them from getting the average rates of return that we're told we'll get if we invest for the long term. Yeah. So just a completely different mindset that we teach with IBC. So hopefully what what you've gained from listening to this show, uh, this episode, is that you really need to start thinking differently when it comes to your money and finance. That paradigm way of thinking of you know chasing that rate of return. Look internally. What what's going out the window? You know what what are you paying interest on every single month? Can you redirect that through? an IBC policy or a host of policies so that you can take that money, redirect it and start using it to build your financial future. Can't say it any better than that. Awesome. Well, anything else uh, we should cover on this episode on rate of return? No, I think that'll cover it. I bet some questions will pop up from people that we can add on in a future episode. Okay. Well, for those listening, if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out. You can find us at the fifth edition.com. And we'd love to hear from you, hear what questions that you have. If you would like to book a strategy session with uh, John or myself, 
you can you can find us there. But that'll wrap it up for our episode number four. And we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, John. Have a great one, everyone. All right. Take care.